Good to see all of you this morning. It's good to be seen by all of you this morning. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. I need to find a young person. <laughs> Jake, thank you. Um, Jake, would you mind going out to the counter and grab the copies of the material for today and pass those out to anybody who needs it, please? Thank you. Um, this material for the first two lessons of our uh, Philippians class and the material for all the lessons uh, for the Wednesday class was made available last Wednesday, but I realize not everybody uh, was here or was able to pick that up. And it was also uh, sent out, the, the Philippians lessons were sent out via email as well. But if you don't have that, Jake will be coming around in just a moment. So I want to, um, I want to begin uh, in, in just a moment with a prayer. Uh, we'll let Jake get back in and get some of that passed around. And while folks are still getting settled, I'll, I'll say some things here. Um, first... I want to say welcome to this joyful study of Philippians. Uh, Philippians is rightly called the book of joy, and we'll see why that is as we go throughout the quarter. But I thought that Philippians and a study of the joy of the gospel would be a fitting counterpart to the lesson that I'm doing on Wednesday, which is um, just depressing. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday's, Wednesday's material, uh, I, I joke and say it's depressing. We're, we're studying suffering and loss, and uh, we're trying to develop a more comprehensive view of suffering, but also of God and how he redeems our suffering and our loss. And we'll have more to say about that, of course, on Wednesdays. Um, I'm curious, though, I don't want you to raise your hands. I am curious, though, how many of you signed up for my classes this quarter because of Wednesday, uh, not because of Sunday? Um, and that's that's fine. Uh, that is a study that I've been doing for several uh, years, uh, it, it seems. And um, so I'm, I'm glad that we can do that. But I thought, you know, if we talk a lot about suffering and loss and pain on Wednesdays, we need something on Sundays that'll, you know, boost us up a little bit. So I thought Philippians seemed to be a good uh, a good contrast. Unlike the Wednesday material, which is already published for the entire quarter, you have all of your lessons available in that booklet. I, I was not able to do that with Philippians. And so I will make this available uh, every week and uh, I will do my best to ensure that each lesson is available both in print and via email one week in advance. And then one other thing before we start into our material for the morning. A lot of times when we do a book study, we study Philippians or we study Colossians or what have you, we'll start off with an introductory lesson answering the five W's, right? The who, what, when, where, and why. We'll talk about who wrote the book, to whom did he write it, when did he write it, what was going on as he wrote, that kind of thing. And of course, there's value in that. But I thought, number one, you've probably done that before with Philippians. But even if you haven't, uh, I thought I'd like to spend some time somewhere else. And since our focus is on joy, I, I wanted to talk about joy this morning. But I have included for you a Bible dictionary entry that answers all of those five W questions. And so you can read through that at your leisure. And if you don't have that, I'll make that available to you. All right. Are we all settled and seated? Thank you, Jake, for doing that. And I noticed somebody else was helping you. I didn't see who it was. Wayne Middleton, who's not young. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jake. Um, all right. Let's pray together and then we'll get into our study. Our Father, we do believe that there is joy and hope in the gospel, and we take joy in that. And we thank you for making that available to us so that we can be happy soldiers of yours on this earth. 
We pray your blessings on us this morning as we study and upon all the classes that are taking place this hour. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible uses the word joy or one of its cognate forms, joyous, joyful, over 200 times. The Bible has a lot to say about joy. And it seems that in both Hebrew and Greek, as well as English, joy and happiness are very much the same idea. So as we think about joy and happiness and being similar concepts, we may not be as familiar with all of those 200 plus scriptures that use the word joy or its cognate forms, but we are familiar with some of them, and we're going to see a lot of those uh, this morning. We're going to see several of them as we make our way uh, through this lesson this morning. But I thought a good warm-up question for us to start things off, uh, as I remember to turn the clicker on here, I, I thought a, a good question to start us off would be this. What are some things that bring us joy in life? And I think there's a lot of things that we could say, and I'm not just looking for spiritual things either, necessarily. What are some things that bring you joy? Grandchildren. I knew that would be the first answer. Okay, good. Grandkids. What else? Your wife. All right. The Bible even says that, doesn't it, right? Proverbs chapter 5. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, right? Rejoice. Take joy. Okay, what else? Not having to cook dinner. <laughs> now, isn't it funny that the man who says he finds joy in his wife immediately says, I don't find joy, or I do find joy in not having to cook dinner for him. That's interesting. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Sandy. I'm sorry? Dogs. Let's say some dogs. Yeah, some dogs. Our dogs, right? You know, it's my dog. I take joy in my dog. Maybe not somebody else's. All right, Joe. God's creation. Yes. Okay, how many times have we been out on a hike? Or we've been somewhere scenic, and we've just been overcome with God's goodness, right? That happens. Okay, what else? Friends, brothers, and sisters. What was the first? Friends, Friends brother. Oh, okay, good. All right, so relationships. Okay, I mean, we, we've said uh, grandchildren. Interesting, we've skipped over children. Yes. Went straight to the grandkids, all right? Um, family, relationships. Okay, and then our family in the Lord. Wayne mentioned when he, I don't know if you, you may not have seen this, but when he said brothers and sisters, he did this. So I, I think he meant us, right? Okay, what else? All right, Marcus? Interesting. Okay, uh, so Marcus is doing some of that right now, uh, assisting the aged with, uh, bring, you mentioned the dogs, uh, using dogs as therapy. Uh, for those who are older, and that, that's a really neat thing that's that's done. Um, health, you said. Okay, good. Take joy in health. Joe, <laughs> what is that, right? A good night's sleep. I don't even know what that is anymore. I haven't slept through the night in almost nine years. Okay, Trudy. I'm sorry? <laughs> yes. I was hoping somebody would say that. Um, you know, for me, in, in terms of the things that don't matter, books and coffee are right are, are high on my list. Uh, I'm, I mean, ultimately, they don't matter. Of course they matter. <laughs> of course they matter, but ultimately. Okay. Yes, sir. You're turning to something more serious and more important. Confidence that Christ forgives our sins. Yes, good. And let, let's just broaden that to say all of the spiritual things that God has made available to us and things that as we grow in our understanding, we grow in our appreciation for all of the good things that he has made available to us. And we're going to close our class this morning with that thought. All right. Now, with all of this, family, kids, grandkids, loved ones, interests, hobbies, scenery, health, all these things we've mentioned, all of these things are good things. And they're not even, many of them are not even necessarily related to the spiritual 
aspect of life or the spiritual dimension of life. And yet, are these things that God has given us that he wants us to find joy in? Yes. Yes. God has given us all of these things, and he wants us to rejoice in each of these because this is a part of what makes life under the sun, to use Solomon's expression. This, these things are part of what makes life under the sun something that we can bear, something that we can tolerate, because there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. There's a lot of negativity in the world. There's a lot of things that can bring us down. And man, don't we need some things that can lift us up, some things that can bring us back to center and say, you know what? It's not all that bad. And in fact, if we're honest with ourselves, we've got things pretty good. So God is very good to us in these regards. But let's think about this question. What are some areas in life where people attempt to find joy, but they come up empty? Now, we may have a lot of answers with this as well, but I'm curious to know, what do you think? And did you notice at the top of your material, I asked you to use scripture to support the answers that you gave? So I would love it if somebody said, people try to find joy in X, and here's a passage that go along, goes along with that. Wealth. Okay. Are there any passages about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's too many to number, right? Uh, people will try to find joy and understand. I think we're, let, let's broaden the term here as we think about joy and happiness. But ultimately, I think what we're getting at with this question is fulfillment, right? Fulfillment. Okay. Um, so as people search for joy, for a joyful fulfillment, they look for it in a number of ways. Wealth is going to be high on the list. I'm sure it was for many of you. Tim, did you have a particular scripture in mind with that? Oh, okay, yeah, so 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. Okay, good. Right. Good. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, shifting away from wealth, some, some other area where people try to find joy and fulfillment. Mel? Love when they would sing, joy, joy, joy. That you know, and and there. That was before you started saying things that you didn't like. You were young, young, yeah, young, young, yeah, young, yeah. And you enjoyed uh, going to church because kids would all go up front, and the song leader would use it just lead them in that song. Right. Kind of song. Yeah. Okay, that's another good one to add to the areas. Yeah, uh, many years, a long time ago, I was going to say many years ago, when you're 34, that's kind of a relative expression. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was at the grocery store, I had a mountain of groceries in my cart, but in the bottom was coffee, and all I could remember singing was going through the store singing, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my cart. Yeah. All right. I just made that up. That's not true. Okay. Other areas where people search for joy, but they come up empty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's a good follow up to my joke I just made. Yeah, Joe. Faith in other people. Okay. Good. That's an interesting one. We we get let down quite a bit, don't we? Yeah. Wayne, what did you say? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so tying that into the material uh, things comment. Yeah. There's uh, certainly there. What else? Uh, how so? Elaborate. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So Trudy said uh, drugs, alcohol, other such substances uh, that people will turn to because they think it will help, usually help with coping with some kind of loss or, or stress or something like that. Um, all of these things are, are areas that people will look to to find answers, to find hope. But biblically speaking and, and spiritually speaking, where does true joy, where does true fulfillment ultimately come from? <laughs> okay, so helping convert someone, but that points to the fact that ultimately joy and fulfillment comes from a right relationship with God. 
because that's where ultimate meaning and, and value comes from. Trying to find joy in other areas is not going to get us there. Uh, it, it doesn't come from pleasure or riches. Uh, you, you remember Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon said, I, I tested my soul with pleasure, and I did not withhold anything from myself. And yet, what's the term that comes to your mind when you think about Ecclesiastes? Vanity. Yeah, it was all a waste. I came up empty. Um, do you remember Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, the, the parable of the sower? The thorny ground, what was it that choked out the good seed? I mean, the thorns, but what were the thorns? What does Jesus say they were? Cares, riches, and pleasures of the world, okay? All of those things are going to end up choking out the spiritual fruit that we might be able to produce. So pleasure in whatever form it may take, it can bring joy and happiness for a time, but it's not lasting, right? The joy that we're talking about in this class is a lasting joy because it finds its source in God. You think about this concept of use value. When you use something, when you utilize something, let's go back to that fast car that Wayne mentioned earlier. You get that car, and if you can get past the buyer's remorse, you enjoy your car. And you get out on the highway, and you drive it fast, and you love to hear the engine, and you sit there, and you kind of do this as you look around. You think you're hot stuff and everything, right? But does that last, that feeling, or does the use value get diminished over time? Diminishes, right? Okay, you see, there are things in this life that we will look to to find joy, and it will give it to us for a little while, but it doesn't last because there's nothing intrinsic to that product or to that substance or to that relationship. There's nothing intrinsic that is able to impart joy permanently, but it's not that way with God. God is able to impart joy forever. He is an endless supply of joy, and that's why we have to look to him. So, not everybody agrees with that, though, because, see, a lot of people think serving God has to be the most depressing thing that they can think of doing. There's no joy in serving God. There's no joy to be found in serving him. Why do people think that way? Okay, and are they wrong in that? They're, no, they're not. Yeah, they're not wrong in that, but what they can't see, and this is your point, Tim, is that there is actually a joy that can come from that self-surrender, okay? So Tim says people want to be free. They don't want to be told what to do by God by, or by anybody else. Why, why else do people think that serving God is just a drag? Wayne? Okay, good. Joe? There's some pressure with that, right? Okay, all right, good. Anything else? Yeah, Jake. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, the Hebrew writer said that Moses uh, chose to forego the pleasures of sin in order to serve God. Yes. So, quite simply, there's pleasure in sin. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. And let, let's think about that. He, Hebrews eleven twenty five. I think um, Moses not only for for went. <laughs> past <laughs> on the pleasures of sin. But the verse says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures. So it wasn't just saying no. It was also saying yes to something that people would want to say no to the affliction that comes along with it. Okay. Patty and then Marcus. It's like uh, when you're 
when you're praying for something and you just know that God's going to give it to you and you don't get it. Mm. And you kind of get disappointed. So, well, what, what did I do wrong? And then, you know, some may get angry. I don't even get angry, but I'll have to realize that, okay, there might be something down the road that'll be better. Right. All right. Now you're tracking towards Wednesday. Okay. So oh. hey, hang with me there. All right, Marcus, go ahead. Okay, good. Good. We don't see the trade off. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good point. So God is considered to be the heavenly killjoy. He's the, the big guy in the sky who always says no, but he never says yes. It's always thou shalt not, it's never thou must. And yes, you can. Um, the Christian life is one of rules. It's strict. It's no fun. Finish this song lyric. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints, sang Billy Joel. Yeah, you know, only the good die. Okay. All right. Yeah, Kyle, go ahead. When in actuality, those things that God warns us against or tells us not to do actually give us more opportunity for doing our life. It's the opposite. With the, the perceived joy that Satan has put on those things is not real. It does, it's fleeting. And by, by abstaining from those things, we have much more opportunity for a true joy. All right, good. Go with me, Romans chapter 8. Uh, your, your comments are just making me think about this passage. This was not uh, in the material or, or anything to consider. But I think this is the way to summarize all of these comments that we're making. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And Paul's going to go on and talk about those who are in the Spirit and what we share in. But are you seeing that simple contrast? People who put their, their minds and their complete focus and energies on the flesh or those who put it on the things according to the spirit? Fleshly versus spiritual. To Kyle's point, the people who focus on the pleasures and the sins and the things that Satan puts out there that attract our attention, where is their focus? And they're not able to see what God is offering to them because you have to put on spiritual glasses to be able to see that. But when you've got your fleshly glasses on, you can't see it. Isn't that what Paul says? They can't subject themselves to the law of God because they're not open to that spiritual dimension to life. And Marcus comment earlier about, you know, people, he said it all comes down to knowledge, I think he said. Uh, having this understanding that, that what God has made available to us is so much better than all of the little baubles and trinkets that we deal with here on this earth that attract our attention for a little while, but they ultimately don't hold it. But the spiritual things can do that. Sandy? Connect with 
our family. And it gives you a feeling of, well, I'm doing something good because I'm. I'm yeah, that's a good point. And, and it is a time for family. It is. But it's also a time for God's family. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So let's go into our next question. This is question number four. What do you think are some things that bring God joy? And we're going to really start to pick up the scripture uh, as we get into this point. What are some things that bring God joy? Yes, sir. Yes, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So there is something that God possesses that's joyful, right? It's his joy that's our strength. So what is it that God finds joy in? And there's no one answer to this. There may be a number of things. Really would love some scripture, though, if you have one to support it. Brian? Okay. All right. God, God finds joy when people hear what he says and then do what he says. You think about James chapter 1, about looking into the, the mirror and uh, do not be hearers only, but be doers of the word. Okay, good. Chris? Oh, good. Yes, that's a good one. God loves a cheerful giver. We hear that one a lot. Uh, it doesn't say that, you know, the word joy is not used, but certainly God takes pleasure when his people are giving people. All right. What else? Dad? Oh, good. Okay. I thought somebody would bring that one up. Um, God has joy in sinners that repent. Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin specifically says that the angels rejoice when that coin and that sheep, metaphorically speaking, when the sinner comes back to God. Alan? Good. Okay, good. So let's, let's go to Isaiah chapter 65, because that's something that uh, I had as well. You mentioned Genesis 3 and God walking in the garden, creating Adam and Eve to enjoy that relationship together. Isaiah chapter 65 talks about God taking joy in his people. Isaiah 65, look at verse 17, beginning. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice, there's our word, forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. I will rejoice in what I create. And what he's talking about here is his people, his Jerusalem. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 says that we Christians, God's people, are heavenly Jerusalem. And this passage says God takes joy in his people. Okay, I don't recall who it was. Somebody back here had a hand up. Joe, it was you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, John 15, and yes. Uh, have you got it? Why don't you go ahead and read it? Oh, you had it. Oh, okay. All right, I'll tell you what, Joe. I have that in my notes, too, uh, just a, a little bit later. Let me come back to that. Willene, go ahead. Okay, uh, well, Lane's comment was that God rejoices in a devoted heart. Good. Um, anything else? Oh, yes. Okay, good. Inner peace. Okay, all right. I'm going to come back to that one for, for, for another question. Because that, that's, that's the joy that we find from God. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. And, and that's another thing that brings Christians joy. Okay. John says um, the pronouncement of joy 
when Jesus came to the earth? When John the Baptist is told in, in, uh, is foretold rather in Luke chapter one, let's go through some of these real quick. Luke chapter one, verse 14, Zacharias is told, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Think about this from God's perspective. The time has now come. Everything God has been working for from eternity is now about to happen. And it begins with the angel coming to Zacharias and Elizabeth and telling them about John the Baptist. Many will find joy in his arrival. Verse 44, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, Elizabeth says, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby, that's John the Baptist, leaped in my womb for joy. Look at Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10. Now we're shifting our attention to Jesus here. Matthew 2 and verse 10. When they saw the star, they, were exceed they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That is the wise men who are going to go and see this child. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. I know we're looking at these quickly. But again, think of these, these pronouncements from God's perspective. Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Great joy is going to come from this child who is born, who ultimately, of course, is coming from God. He's coming from heaven. And so God is watching this unfold as all of these events are beginning. Jesus comes to the earth. He picks his disciples. Let's go back to John 15, which is what Joe uh, mentioned uh, just a moment ago. John chapter 15, Jesus is with his disciples here shortly before his death. John 15 and verse 10, if you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy. Now we're talking about what brings God joy. And Jesus says something here. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Look at chapter 17, verse 13. Jesus is now praying. He says to his father, now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have joy, Jesus says, and I want to impart that to my disciples. How is he going to do that, though, when he's about to die? Look at chapter 16. He tells them this. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. Jesus has a joy that he wants to impart to his people. All right, Joe, what was your comment? Yeah. Good, good. This is the opposite. This does not bring God joy, the death of those who choose to turn away from him. All right, our time's getting away from us. So I'm going to skip over question number five. What are some things that rob Christians of joy? We've actually hinted at some of these things already in class. Disappointment in others, I think somebody brought up earlier. That can take joy away from us. Um, ultimately, what robs us of joy is sin. 
Psalm 51 is really helpful in that regard, particularly verses 7, 8, and 12. David mentions, after his affair with Bathsheba, he mentions the joy that's been taken from him because of his sin. But let's get to this last question. What are some things that bring Christians joy? What do we find joy in as God's people? And to get back to our earlier point, these are things that the world is not going to understand. This takes that spiritual set of glasses, right? Kyle, did you have your hand up just a second ago? Okay, I'll come back to you. Okay, Sandy. Joy and service. Wow. How, how could you ever come to that conclusion if you don't have the spiritual goggles on, right? Nobody finds joy in service. Okay, and that goes, yeah, somebody quoted 3 John 1 earlier. Uh, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth, right? And that's always applied at baptisms and put on coffee mugs and stuff. And, you know, th there really is some value in that idea. Of course, we, we love to see our kids walking in God's ways. David? Yes, yes. I'm glad I, I'd forgotten about that verse. That's that's good. Uh, Jude, give me the verse number, David. Twenty, twenty-four. Jude twenty-four. Joe. Ah, good. Which says that Christians find joy in their trials. You cannot come to that conclusion with worldly glasses on. You can't do it. But God's people can. All right, uh, let me call out some other ones real quickly. Um, the, the Philippian jailer, after he obeyed the gospel, he rejoiced in his salvation. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 4 that we rejoice in the Lord, that there is joy to be found in the Lord. Um, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22, the Spirit lives in us. That's something that Christians find joy in. Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 12 that we can even rejoice amidst persecution. Wow. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, he says. Again, that doesn't make sense to the world. Kyle, I'm coming back to you. You got, you got your comment now? And Sandy took your, yeah, she, she took your point. I hate it when that happens. Okay. I want to close with this key idea. Go back, if you have it, to the table of contents for your material. Look at the lessons, where we're going as we go through the book of Philippians. And this is really a textual study of Philippians, but we are thinking about joy all along through this. Scroll down through there and tell me how many of these things that Paul finds joy in and wants us to find joy in, how many of those things are earthly in nature? How many of those things are temporal? And I'm not saying there's no temporal element to it, but I'm saying ultimately, are they temporal, earthly, or are they spiritual and heavenly? And doesn't that underscore the idea that ultimately our joy has to come from above and not from below? Okay, thanks everybody. We'll do lesson two next Sunday, Lord willing. Material for Wednesday, if you don't have it, it's out on the counter. And if I need to make more, I certainly will. Thank you, everyone.